numbering, which was good to help get all the connections right. I think you saw that the number five would have a negative charge now. That's good. Is this what you got so far? No, we're pretty much done. Do you remember from the videos what would be our last step? Um, let me just, uh, wouldn't it just, um, couldn't we just protonate? Yeah, from whom? The ETOH. That's right. We actually formed an ETOH in the so first step anyway, balance. and that's our solvent. So yeah, we might as well do that as our last step. We have a strong base here. As usual, we're using a base that matches our L group, so we don't need to worry about nucleophilic competition. This is going to deprotonate this alpha carbon. How do we know it would prefer to deprotonate this alpha carbon and not this alpha carbon? Yeah. If we deprotonate here, we'd only have one resonance structure to stabilize the negative charge, but here there's two resonance structures, putting the negative charge on either oxygen. So we know that a enolate that's between two carbonyls is especially easy to form, so we don't need to worry about this getting deprotonated. Instead, this is going to be our electrophile. Why is the number four electrophilic? Because of the, the resonance form that can be formed. Uh, you can, uh... There's another resonance structure, as we saw, where the number four has a positive charge. We don't need to bother drawing that, uh, but we should know in the back of our mind that there's a reason why this attack is happening. And then we've got to make room for that by moving these electrons. And the simplest thing is just to shift them over here to the number five. And then we know that we don't like to end up with the charge. Now, theoretically, something that sometimes is done in OCHEM is then we could use this to do another nucleophilic attack. For example, we could use this to do an SN2, say. We could put in, say, this and have it attack here. That's, that comes up a lot in some OCHEM classes, but I don't see your instructor talking about it in your notes. So you'll see if that comes up in the homework, but so we won't talk about this because this is not in the notes. So instead of using this for another nucleophilic attack, if there's nobody else to attack nucleophilically, we can just have it protonate from the solvent. So here's our final product. Overall, what has happened? Overall, we've attached the number two to the beta carbon. We've just attached this, alpha car uh, this number two to this alpha carbon over here. Um, so, what changes have happened to this molecule? Well, really no changes except that this is now connected to another carbon. And what changes have happened here? Well, there's a new carbon attached here, and the pi bond is gone. Those are basically the only changes. Notice that overall, the carbonyl hasn't changed, because we said we weren't attacking the carbonyl. So we're not doing anything to the carbonyl over here, we're basically just adding to this pi bond. We're attaching um, the, uh, the enolate to here, and we attach the hydrogen to here. Okay. So that was, that's how you could do this without doing the whole mechanism. To do this without doing the whole mechanism, you would just attach the enolate carbon to here and the hydrogen to here. Now, this is not the mechanism that your instructor had in your notes. So I'll just briefly sketch out what the instructor had in the notes. In their notes, the instructor did do this. Uh, then they protonated this oxygen. So that gave them something that looked like this. Okay. Uh, so after you protonate this oxygen, it would look like this. 
However, this is an enol, right? Mm -hmm. And we know that enols tautomerize. Mm -hmm. And after an enol tautomerizes, what does it look like? It looks like this, mm -hmm. which is basically what we ended up with over here. So it's much better, uh, especially in the multiple choice test, just to cut a long story short. Why bother making the enol? This is going to reform into the carbonyl anyway. So even though our mechanism isn't fully 100% accurate, I think it's, uh, it's just fine for solving problems. So for our purposes, let's just put the negative charge on the number five. We won't worry about pushing it up to the oxygen. All right, so now we have to start watching out for these alpha-beta unsaturated ketones. At this point, students have gotten so comfortable with attacking carbonyls, it's hard for them to remember to attack the beta carbon. So watch out for the alpha-beta unsaturated carbonyls and attack the beta carbon here, not the, al not the carbonyl, unless you've got the alpha lithium or the grignard, like we talked about. Oh, by the way, so a Michael addition is when an enolate attacks the beta carbon of a alpha beta unsaturated aldehyde or ketone. So what we just did is a microaddition. Okay. When we have an enolate doing the attack on that beta carbon, that's a microaddition. You can say it really is an addition because an addition is when you remove a pi bond. That's what we did. I'm sorry, it's an enolate attacking a beta carbon, correct? Yeah, an enolate attacking the beta carbon of an alpha beta unsaturated aldehyde or ketone. Now, the alpha-beta unsaturated aldehyde or ketone is what we could call a Michael acceptor. You see that, why that would be a logical name, a Michael acceptor? Because the Michael acceptor is accepting the electrons from the nucleophile. So anything that can participate in one of those Michael additions is, as, as the electrophile is a Michael acceptor. So for example, this would also be a Michael acceptor. This is also a Michael acceptor because, again, there is a resonance structure that puts an, a positive charge on this beta carbon. This is an aldehyde. Is this a Michael acceptor? Yes. In fact, I think this is the Michael acceptor we were just talking about. Could we use a similar argument to say that this beta carbon is electrophilic? Yes. Yeah, so this is also a Michael acceptor. So I, actually, I shouldn't have been saying uh, alpha, beta, unsaturated, and aldehyde, and ketone. I should have been saying alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl. It doesn't have to be an aldehyde or a ketone. It just has to be an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl. What type of functional group do we have here on the right? An ester. But we're still going to be able to do a Michael addition. Remember that the basic reaction then is just this. The basic reaction is the nucleophile attacks the, al attacks the beta carbon. That kicks the electrons onto the alpha carbon, and then the alpha carbon protonates. It's really not that complicated a reaction. The nucleophile attacks the beta carbon, the alpha carbon gets the electrons and then protonates, and nothing really happens to the carbonyl. Now notice again how previously you would have expected the nucleophile to attack over here, wouldn't you? Yeah. We would expect it to attack over here and kick off this leaving group. Uh, but again, now we should learn that uh, uh, we can instead attack this beta carbon over here. Okay. That would also be a Michael addition. We could use the same resonance argument here. What type of functional group is this? Uh, yeah, and then right. So again, we can have uh, do a Michael addition here. This is another Michael acceptor. group is this? Mm. On the right? Um, that's a cyanide, isn't it? 
That's right. Although it's best to use cyanide for the ion. The best name for this would be a nitrile. The best name for this would be a nitrile. That's uh, the carboxylic acid derivative that doesn't, that doesn't look the same as the other carboxylic acid derivatives. Now, this does not look the same as our other Michael acceptors, but we could still draw a resonance structure where there's a positive charge on this carbon, and we can still think of this as the beta carbon. This is the nitrile carbon, alpha carbon, and beta carbon, so this is also a Michael acceptor. 